no, this is not the end of any uh, gold bull market. What it is, it's more of the same thing, the stupidity of, of, of manipulating uh, and rehypothecating both LBMA and COMEX contracts to drive the price down to um, maybe buy themselves some more time or to help cover their short positions that are, are growing very tenuous and and bleeding them dry, them being the big bullion banks. So yeah, I think this is just uh, a correction amidst a primary bull market. Then it won't be an easy run. It will be volatile. The bull wants to throw as many people off its back as possible. Lately, the precious metals market has experienced a noticeable pullback in prices, leading to widespread speculation about the end of the current bull market. Andy Schechtman suggests that this downturn is merely a correction rather than a sign of a declining trend. Market corrections are common and can be seen as opportunities rather than setbacks, offering a chance for investors to enter the market at lower prices. Andy highlights that a significant factor in the precious metals market is China's role, not just as a major buyer, but also as a key producer. Recent reports hinting at China reducing its gold purchases due to high prices have circulated, yet seasoned analysts are skeptical of these claims. The general consensus among experts is that China's investment habits in gold are strategic and long-term, unaffected by short-term price volatility. There is also a discussion around the accuracy of China's reported gold reserves. Some believe that China holds far more gold than it officially states, making its market influence much more substantial than publicly acknowledged. This underreporting can lead to misconceptions about global gold supply and demand, further complicating market predictions and strategies. For investors and market watchers, it's crucial to look beyond sensational headlines and consider the broader dynamics at play, especially China's ongoing impact. Understanding these factors can provide a more grounded perspective on where the precious metals market is headed and highlight potential investment opportunities during market corrections. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview, but first hit the like button, smash the subscribe button, and turn on notifications so you do not miss out our daily readings recaps. Enjoy the episode. Silliest premature conclusions I've ever seen. Um, you know, first of all, no one has ever believed the numbers that that China puts out. That's always been the conventional wisdom that, you know, they tell us they have 24, 25, 2600 metric tons. Alistair McLeod believes they have 38,000 metric tons over five times what we supposedly have at Fort Knox, which of course hasn't been audited since 1956 but it was always you can never believe what they have always and you get this one report that shows uh that they've ceased buying for one month out of the last 20 and now all of a sudden oh the price is too high the the bull market's over china's not buying anymore i think it's i think it's crazy i think it's foolish and not only has china been buying for forever and not updating their numbers very frequently. We have no idea how much they own. They're also the largest producers in the world, and they've been producing at uneconomical price levels using our trade and balance forever. So no, this is what this is, was a massive short position on COMEX, where the commercial banks were literally as extended as I've ever seen them. And so one would expect that there would be some sort of a pullback, hoodwinking the managed money into taking the other side of the trade. And you know, it's still well above its 200 day moving average. So there's still a little bit of room for it to correct. But no, this is not um, the end of a bull market. It is a, a correction within a market where if you've been at this long enough, you know, this is just part and parcel what to expect. But it's becoming far harder to do that in an environment where we're seeing such such copious amounts of deliveries off of the exchanges. And, you know, three, four Fridays ago, we we saw. $500 million worth of gold bars be delivered to Brinks Hong Kong, which many people believe is then trucked over to the Shanghai Gold Exchange and sold out because they purchased kilo bars, the mini contracts. So that's what the Shanghai Exchange trades. But you're seeing bleed downs in the in the COMEX and the LBMA and also on the Shanghai Exchange. Um, you're seeing countries like India bought one and a half times the amount of gold in the first quarter of this year than they bought all of last year. And they just brought back 100 metric tons from the Bank of England, removing the counterparty risk. We see Saudi Arabia and Egypt and a half a dozen African countries bring all their gold back from 
the New York Fed. We are seeing central banks buy at levels like Turkey that the world has never seen. In fact, the amount of gold that the central banks hold is as much as just before Nixon closed the gold window. It's almost as if they are preparing for some form of a gold standard. So no, this is not the end of any uh, gold bull market. What it is, it's more of the same thing, the stupidity of of, of manipulating uh, and rehypothecating both LBMA and COMEX contracts to drive the price down to um, maybe buy themselves some more time or to help cover their short positions that are, are growing very tenuous and, and bleeding them dry, them being the big bullion banks. So yeah, I think this is just uh, a correction amidst a primary bull market. Then it won't be an easy run. It will be volatile. The bull wants to throw as many people off its back as possible. So have strong fingertips. Look at this as a subsidy the way the, the central banks do. And um, so, no, this is nothing other than normal correction within a volatile bull market, uh, precious metals, which typically are far more volatile than the other markets that we would normally talk about. In today's news recap, Silver price nears 29.50, eyes on U.S. CPI and Fed rate. Despite reduced bets for a September Fed rate cut and a strong U.S. labor market, the silver price regained strength, turning bullish around 29.44 and reaching an intraday high of 29.49. The upward trend is attributed to a slight weakness in the U.S. dollar, which lost some gains recently due to cautious sentiment ahead of the latest U.S. consumer inflation figures and the Federal Open Market Committee meeting on Wednesday. Additionally, escalating conflict and instability in the Gaza region have increased demand for safe haven assets, further supporting silver prices. This geopolitical tension is seen as a key factor in helping the silver price remain strong. The U.S. dollar has been gaining momentum, driven by growing investor confidence in the economy. Expectations for a Federal Reserve interest rate cut in September have dwindled due to strong labor market conditions and persistent inflation, pushing the U.S. dollar to nearly a one-month high. Investors are now focused on the upcoming U.S. consumer inflation figures and the monetary policy decision. The Fed may consider a modest 25 basis point rate cut later in the year, possibly in November or December. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview. Info in description. Now smash the subscribe button, turn on notifications, and share this video with a silver bug. Enjoy the episode. And the switch is flipped, and that's why I like the term little by little by little by little, but then all at once, logarithmic decay. The little by little you can see. And I'll, I'll show you that in here in one second, but you can see the little by little in all of these bilateral deals that are being struck and using the M bridge and, and selling treasuries and buying gold. That's the little by little by little. And yes, the all at once, every country in the world has had to stockpile dollars for 50 years. It was 50 years last week that the deal was signed in order to buy oil. And if everyone had no incentive to ever hold those dollars again, the dumping of those dollars, this is the great reset I talk about, would create hyperinflation as that tsunami of dollars hit our shore, overwhelm the issuer, the U.S., creating hyperinflation. And the byproduct of hyperinflation is to see interest rates rise to compensate, not directed by the Fed or Powell, who doesn't want to do that and blow everything up. But if the market does it, we now have a villain to point to. Those, those guys dump the dollar. They, they're not taking the dollar for oil any longer. It's, it's Xi Jinping and Putin and OPEC and Saudi Arabia, how could they do this to us? Well, forget about the fact that we signed an executive order to go green or that our bonehead, knucklehead, embarrassing lead economic advisor who embarrassed himself horribly in that video that circulated around Twitter for the last few weeks about him trying to explain money creation and bond sales, his whole theory is to lose the reserve status. And when we talk about uh, the share of reserves, as of just a couple of days ago, gold share of global international reserves has jumped to 17.6% in 2023, the most in 27 years. The share has almost doubled since 2016 as central banks ramp up purchase. But here's the interesting part. Gold is now the second largest asset held in global central bank reserves, exceeding the euro for the first time ever. The number one is still the U.S. dollar, but its 48% world share is down from 60%. Meanwhile, the central bank's net gold purchases saw a record in Q1 2024. They're selling dollars, they're selling euro, they're selling treasuries, and they are buying gold, which can't be sanctioned. And so, yeah, the, the all at once hasn't happened yet. But how hard would it be for OPEC to say we're done taking dollars for oil? That's the rumor that's been circulating around the Internet that the petrodollar deal wasn't renewed. Now, 
I would be the first one to scream that from the rooftops, but I haven't seen any official acknowledgement of that yet. So I'm not going to run with it other than to say a lot of people are saying it's already happened. Um, I don't know if I can believe that or not. I never saw a 50 year timeline on the original agreement, nor have I seen any official statements from Saudi Arabia or the US, but I'll tell you one thing. We did see the United Arab Emirates say we don't want to take dollars anymore, and they're the seventh largest producer of oil in the world and, and an OPEC member, and we're admitted into BRICS alongside Saudi Arabia. So to imagine an environment where the world dumps dollars because they're no longer needed for oil purchases, as every OPEC country is on the Belt Road, and all of these countries are moving away from this country because of sanctions and, and because of our behavior and because we're going green. So what do they need to work with us for? A currency where we've obviously chosen inflation over austerity and a bond market that's been volatile as hell for the last couple of years. So yeah, time to move. And it's the safety in numbers. And if indeed we did see that moment, and Rafi is right, the all at once moment where dollars are forsaken because you don't need them for oil anymore. And to his point, every country in the world's had to stockpile them for 50 years. Yeah, the ramifications or the result would be disastrous because you would see interest rates spike to compensate for that hyperinflation and all of the assets in this country, stocks, bonds, real estate, and even the banks, which are over leveraged and undercapitalized and the insurance companies are loaded with treasuries. They're all inversely related or correlated or valued to a massive spike in interest rates. So yeah, it would be disastrous and it would happen very quickly. If they had a common settlement currency, even if it were pegged to gold or whatever, using, selling, or, or buying from one of the 10 members with the uh, common settlement currency, you know, with the proceeds, you, you would want to use it to buy something. So you only have nine other countries to shop with. Well, there was just a meeting that happened, you know, as we've talked about on this show ad nauseum, there were going to be 200 meetings between the beginning of the year and the big BRICS meeting in October. And they just came out with a report here um, of a meeting that happened uh, at, it's called NIZHNY, Nizhny Novograd. And there was a meeting that just came out and there were 54 point uh, summation article that I read. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple of them here. One is that this was just a couple days ago, 21,000 people attended from 139 nations. 78,000 bilateral deals were signed on the sidelines, meaning I'm going to trade with my local currency and your local currency. We won't use the dollar. And most of these deals are now not putting their reserves, the excess into treasuries. They're putting them into gold. But the third one is the big one, and that is 59 nations plan to join BRICS. This just came out of this meeting the other day. And so if you have 59 countries to trade with in common settlement, you can go shopping in 59 countries instead of 10. When they get this critical mass, this the the, the a, a large enough group of of countries that are now approaching, you know, you add fifty nine countries on here, you bring in the Shanghai Cooperation and the Eurasian Economic Union, which you keep hearing about and hearing about, it will happen. And then look at the Belt Road Initiative. You're talking ninety percent of human population, and so when you have more and more and more countries signing on to to the BRICS, fifty nine countries have planned to join. Um, you have the ability to issue a common settlement currency. It doesn't have to be a reserve currency. That's where gold can come in. Gold has outpaced the bond market since the beginning of the century, handily, many times over, but it lacks the counterparty risk that we find in treasuries that, as of today, can now be confiscated. The EU plans on um, taking the interest from the frozen assets uh, in the in the European Union and using those to act as collateral and, and whatnot and towards giving a $50 million loan to the Ukraine um, using frozen assets. They're stealing another country's assets. It's wrong and it's going to have ramifications. And this is what is incentivizing the coalition of all of these countries to move away from the hypocrisy, the hegemony, and and the, the threat of confiscation of assets or sanctioning of assets at the worst the least, if we do not align ideologically with those countries. And, and it's about as foolhardy as one could get. And the embridge is just another way for them to continue to de-dollarize and to do transactions that can't be sanctioned and can't be attacked by the SWIFT, to do transactions that give them the ability to, to maneuver outside of the SWIFT channels. What do you think of Andy's point? Is the East taking over the metals? Will the U.S. dollar officially be replaced by the BRICS nations? 
Post in the comments section down below your honest opinion on the complex situation we're going on and watch this video right here because you'll love it. I see you on the other side.